I'm Rachel Adams and I'm with Robert Littleford and the pair of us have worked on a project called In the Footsteps of Revilius. Yes, and um, it was an exhibition that was at the Marine Workshops in New Haven. Um, and whilst, while investigating Revilius and this location, which is a small area of land between Lewis and the port of New Haven, about six miles, that um, Revilius visited and painted and drew um, and was stationed at as a war artist for a while, that we realised this area, this small overlooked area of land, actually had more relevance and importance um, to the cultural, cultural landscape of Britain than people might realise. It's got, it's, it's actually, it's got layers and layers, yeah. haven't it, hasn't it? Yeah. Everyone's, so we, you know, we called the map that we made connected because we realised that there was all these connections that you could actually follow um, and that was somehow significant more than you thought they might be. Um, and we didn't, it wasn't, I mean, initially we thought we'd follow in artist footsteps, yeah. which would overlap a surprising amount of people. But we came up with, um, we had a sort of storytelling route, route um, we are just looking at colour, folklore, and following the river, which yeah. is a natural kind yeah. of, natural path through the... So the, the River Ouse, um, this six mile length of it, it goes through the South Down National Park, um, which is the area that Revillius, as well as the Port of New Haven, painted a lot of landscapes of the National Park. Um, and when people talk about, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it goes on about the green and pleasant land. Actually, this is, the South Downs are the iconic green and pleasant land of Great Britain. They're smooth, rounded hills. Um, white cliffs. White cliffs. It's your, you know, it's what tourists and visitors come to this area to see is um, Seven Sisters, Cookmere Cook, Haven, yeah, Beachy Head, Meandering. Yeah. I mean, in recent times, obviously, you know, the river's fairly full of sewage. But um, other than that, it's historically, it's been. I mean, we. What did we find out? It was, you know, the area. There's been a settlement here since Saxons in the sixth century. So, there's like, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of layers. Yeah. Tell us about tell us about Charleston, though, Robert, because I know that you're a real fan of that those aristocrats, aren't you? Um, or yes do you set your teeth against them? Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, and in the context of Rebellious, so you know, I often had this little kind of movie idea that used to go through my head, and it was about um, when I found out that Rebellious, you know, used to. And we know from his paintings and drawings that he used to sit on the train and paint from the carriages. Um, and that we know that Virginia Woolf used to use the same train and, and mm -hmm. write in her diaries about it. Um, and for a seven year period from about 1935 to um, the year of Revillis' death in 1942, um, they were both around this area, both traveling on the same train. And trains in those days had little carriages with a, 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 an aisle going up the side of the carriages. So you'd often be in a carriage with a few- Little compartment. A little compartment, exactly. So you might, so you'd be strangers on the train, basically. Yeah, you might, you might find yourself actually sitting yeah. opposite somebody there. Yeah, so my, my little movie idea was, so what would happen theoretically with Virginia Woolf sitting opposite Eric Revillius and how would they interact? Um, and they must have known of each other because they were both ce celebrities, really. Um, Virginia Woolf had written The Waves, which had made her, you know, it was an experimental novel which really put her in, in the history books and made her a people she was celebrated as a writer ever since a pioneer ever, of the stream of consciousness yes and then eric revillius was the official war artist um 
but also it had done murals in public buildings and um, it had exhibitions at the Royal Academy and the, everyone knew about Eric Vredi They Vredi might have Vredi heard of each other, they might not have been able to identify each other. Well, this is, the, this is one yeah. of the questions. So one of the things with Rebilius was because he was the official war artist, he was made a captain um, and so he had access to all areas so he could paint and draw, you know, but it meant that he had to wear his uniform so that the soldiers could acknowledge it, the fact that he was an officer. Um, Bloomsbury lot, meanwhile. Bloomsbury lot, meanwhile, were all pacifists and conscientious objectors. Yeah. So they tended to look down or sneer at soldiers and people in uniform. Um, so if Eric Revillius and Virginia Woolf were in the same compartment, would they have even spoke? Would there be tension between them? Do you think that, because, you know, Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant over at Charleston, um, you know, it's not ever so far from Furlong's, Peggy Angus's house, yeah. where, where Eric Revillius and, uh, you know, Paul Nash, Herbert Reed, Edward Borden, John Piper. I mean, you know, a lot of people went and stayed there. Yeah. I mean, they must have. They must have kind of heard on the grapevine. I mean, they're you know. Well, I mean, the, I mean, also a local farmer would yes. mention it, wouldn't it? That, that so he... Paul Nash taught Eric Rebellious at the Royal College of Art, um, and he Paul Nash also worked at the Omega Workshops for Duncan Grant. Um, oh, so they'd have like crossed paths, of course, up in Bloomsbury. Yeah, so they would have even known about each other. Yeah. Um, be prior to be, being in New Haven, I think. Um, and I wonder if, because another little story we heard is that, that Virginia Woolf would have left Monk's house. She used to go for walks every day. She'd cross the small bridge at South East, which is the only way to cross the river, unless you come all the way to New Haven. Um, and then she would walk up on the east side of on the downs to Muggery Pope, funny little um, derelict farm. But we know that Eric Revillius and Terza, his wife, they used to kind of walk there. So, I mean, they they could well, and in a fictional imaginary way, they could have been um, bumping into each other countless times, couldn't they? Yeah. Connecting. Or not connecting. Or not connecting. Mm, no. Yes. In fact, because we, we read this brilliantly funny but angry, hilariously, um, just so well articulated article by the writer and broadcaster Ian Marchant, who um, grew up in New Haven. And he'd, he'd read uh, Olivia Lang's book, To the River, which was about the sort of Bloomsburyfication of, of this area. And he, he uses this, this recurring phrase, setting his teeth against. He sets his teeth against the, um, that, you know, those aristocrats, because they, they were so um, dismissive, weren't they, of the yeah. sort of working port town. Yeah. That's at the river mouth, the harbour mouth of that. Of that. But, but even then, do you think, so this period of seven years, um, was in preparation for the Second World War, most of it. There was 300,000 Canadian troops came through Sussex. Was it 5,000? 5,000 5, were stationed in New Haven, mm -hmm. um, plus troops from the UK and troops from the States. Um, it was a bustling... It must have been. I mean, yeah. it was Jenny Flood at yeah. the uh, New Haven Museum, which is the yeah. most fantastic little museum at Paradise Park, she was telling us that um, there must have been, you know, like 25 big ships in the harbour. Mm. I mean, when the big ferry comes in now, yeah. you think, wow, that's, you know, that takes up yeah. a lot of river space. But imagine like 25 ships yeah. and those big sea leg things. Yeah. What do they call those? Anyway, those things that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. take stuff out of big barges, you know. <laughs> But the, the imagine the hub and it would just have been it would have been an amazing place. Yes. Compared to Lewis, which was all kind of 
cobbles and and yes and antique shops yeah. and, and when you think rooms. so charleston is equidistant between lewis and new haven so it's about three miles mm. either way um so for people to go and do their grocery shopping that kind of they could come to either to be honest and there'd probably be um, access to more stuff in New Haven because they had to feed all the troops and there would be like... Well, and the, yeah. and this is before the the town centre yeah. had been carved up by its one-way system yeah. and the old town centre was beautiful, you yeah. know, little pubs and shops and there were like three little cinemas. Yeah. I mean, it was a really buzzing little place. But because it's always been a working port, busy stations, lots of... stuff. I mean, there's always been this terribly middle-class view of of New Haven being what they call what do they call it? They call it a shithole. <laughs> Is that what they call it, Robert? Yeah, yeah. But I think yeah, you're right. You the 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 Bloomsbury lot probably. So whilst I th I mean I think it's very important that people can be conscientious objectors and pacifists and. It's where naturally I find my inclination as well is to go that way, um, and they were, you know, they were, they wanted to be part of Europe. They were, they wanted to embrace a kind of um, universal kind of modernist modernist approach to the world. So they were against war, and I think that's important. But when I, the problem for me becomes when it becomes a class thing that it's only the people with the luxury to be able to say no. Um, say no and all the rest have to go to war to defend the country um, and so you know on on so with the Canadian troops so there was 5,000 stationed in New Haven they did a practice run for D-Day um, they all went out on ships to to France um, three and a half thousand of them died in one day and 1500 came back Dieppe yeah. Raid thing. Yeah. So, um, and it's always been a place of kind of. I mean, we've we our project yeah. expanded into the idea of New Haven as a border yeah. because it's got the big fort. But I mean, it's also got the kind of um, you know the 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 big on Castle Hill. Yeah. You know, what's that area called? You know, it would have been a Saxon kind of hill fort. Hill fort. Then there's the Palmerston Fort of the 19th century, which then became um, all the coastal defences. So it's always been a kind of place of place of defence and border. I wonder if that's yeah, that sort of you know. I mean, I think that's important, and I think maybe that's why it's so important is because um, because of its proximity to London it meant that that kind of gentrification all the London people the writers and the artists who were coming down from London who had access to seeing you know international exhibitions and you know mm. so they'd see all the impressionists and everything coming over from Paris so they'd be aware of that kind of the globalism um, they'd come down and stay in their country houses um, but they'd be on the port which was then you could get a ferry to France mm. so it was it was yeah but we've got we we, we know that um, Revillius, Edward Borden, John Piper, Julian Trevelyan you know they're all um, either pre-war during the war or post-war you know were, yeah. were doing fantastic kind of you know prints of the harbour and yeah. and so on and there's and so, there's yeah, been a yeah. continual kind yeah. of you so know. and i think you know one of the things so then you have to talk about modernism so um which was important as an idea back then and i think ezra pound said um was it make it new that's um whatever was going on you should make a new a better version of it um and so all the artists would be coming to New Haven and what they would what be wanting to paint and draw is the industry of the harbour. Mm. Um, because that, that's where they, 
because the modernist aesthetic was that's what you should be doing. Um, and the, but oddly enough, that we we know that Revillers and Borden used to stick hope the hope yeah. in, and the hope in in nineteen I don't know nineteen thirty six or something was kind of this, this old flinty yeah. inn that had been there for forever. Um, it was kind of rebuilt in the deco style, designed by the same architect as the one who who designed the Shoreham Airport building. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. real. F- yeah, you know, yeah. modernist European yeah. yes. architecture. Yeah. You know, there was a kind of real vision for architecture. And we also know that, I mean, didn't oh no, Erno Goldfinger, um, he used to stay at Furlongs with Peggy Angus. I mean, there's a lot of modern thinking going on. It's just that, it's, it's just weird that somewhere along the way, New Haven's got this kind of reputation from people outside of it you know the Brighton Lewis Eastbourne London that it's it's not a great place to be but we know I mean we've we work here and we know lots of artists who are you know without any fanfare you know beavering away in their sort of studios working on stuff it really is Uh, because it's on the edges and it's it allows you um, to pursue your what you want to do without being influenced by um, other stuff that's going on I guess yeah I love the fact that you know there's this there's this sort of these layers like you said this sort of you know it's like you pull at the thread and yeah. it just keeps on you keep on discovering sort of you know how it's all woven together, how it's all connected. And in amongst all of it, there's things like um, uh, the Vanta Black, who, you know, Anish Kapoor was granted exclusive rights to use use that in his artistic applications, yeah. that bottomless, you know, pitch pitch black. That's produced just a just hundred yards from here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so there's things like, like, art, technology, you know, tucked away, going on. I find that really fascinating. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I find it fascinating that there's this kind of cultural, you know, that, that it's the centre of a lot of things that seem to be going on and yet it's overlooked at the same time. Mm. The Parker Pen Factory yeah. was here for decades, yeah. wasn't it? I think that, um, you know, it was there from the 1920s you know, you think of all those, all those people, Dylan Thomas and Graham Greene and, you know, writing their stuff with their trusty Parker pen. Someone told me that even the Queen, her favourite pen was and a... Winston Churchill, I think. ...was a Parker pen, you know, and it would have made, again, just like, you know, just a few feet away over there. So, uh, and I think about, so, Aldous Huxley, so in 1932, I think it was, wrote Brave New World... Um, and it was what with a Parker pen I imagine it was a Parker <laughs> pen who knows Yeah. <laughs> but his connection so he was the gardener for Lady Otterine Morell who was part of a Bloomsbury group and he used to visit Charleston um, and after he left after he stopped working for her, he started to write Brave New World um, and I think if there was one book that kind of symbolised um that kind of modernist kind of you know yeah. changing the way the world is going to be and not necessarily for a good thing would be Brave New World and maybe one of the, the top 10 books of the 20th century um, and yet it's connected to New Haven yeah no I think it's, uh, it's and you, sorry and, and you think oh well you know is that tenuous maybe and I think when you think about the Bloomsbury group and the bohemian sort of lifestyle and you realise that Aldous Huxley was part of that, um, then it all starts to make sense because there was a kind of fluidity about who they were shagging because they all seemed to be sleeping. Open marriages. All had open marriages. All seemed to be 
not gender specific Fluid. in the who they were having a relationship with. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And it, 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 you know, how could it not influence his writing when he was writing Brave New World? So, and I suppose so. In Marchant's kind yeah. of setting his teeth again, he's not setting his teeth against that. He's it's the it's the Bloomsburyfication of you know of of how. Charleston is seen yes. now. No. You know, because if, if that period, if they were all modernists um, and they're trying to change the world and embrace that change um, and it's kind of, you know, percolated down to today, um, that's a good thing. So he's not setting his teeth against that, but he's maybe setting his teeth against the fact that it's only the middle class who have that kind of choice to to make those changes, um, and you know everyone else has to toe the line. Yeah, it's a, it's I think it's it's such a, a brilliantly. I mean, we ended up making the connected map because you kind of want to you want to reveal all all this stuff and how it everything's cross-referencing everything's yeah. everything nothing exists on by itself, itself on its own yeah. it's because because someone else you know introduced someone to someone and yeah. you know and it's it's the layers and stuff yeah it's i love that i yeah. mean I'm, I'm gonna guess that you know you could probably do this with with any place you know because we're, we're kind of examining the sort of spirit of a place but what's really interesting is it's it's that New Haven continues to have this this reputation, doesn't it? That it's not it it it's it's it resists the bloomsbrification of, yes. of it. Yeah. It it continues to be a play, a site of aggregate hills, scrap metal, yeah. um, complaints about the one way system. Yeah. Um, you know, annoyance at having to wait for the swing bridge to to open or close or whatever. You know, it's it's it holds on to that reputation. It yeah. defies that sort of you know that. But what what appeals to me about is 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 that it might actually be the home of the radical and the cutting yeah. edge and um, exciting reinventions and. Of society and and changing, you know, that's what it continues to be yeah. an edge place, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. It's never got it's it's never become comfortable. Yeah. And um and although Virginia Woolf lived just a, just up the river. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't think she could comfortably walk through New Haven without um. Without <laughs> making some acerbic little <laughs> comments about yeah. Yeah. And so that's why Ian Marchant sets his teeth, is because... Because even when they were living kind of yeah. just, just beyond and living, that you yeah. know, entitled and radical yeah. creative life, um, they were sniffy about, yeah. about the actual place. Yes. And, and if you think at that point in time that... Um, New Haven was its most international because it had all these foreign troops here. Um, yeah. It was, and yet you could still sneer and at it's, it. Yeah, and it's always been a point yeah. of arrival and departure. Yeah. It's a, it's a lively, exciting place. And what's that Sussex phrase? Won't be drove. Won't be drove. Little film that was made. It's Sussex. It's on the connections map, but you just have to look at it. <laughs>